Welcome to this month's Big Picture episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, where Pete Wharton and I dissect the multitude of macroeconomic factors that are shaping our housing markets and the broader economy. And there's lots to discuss today, including the RBA's interest rate rise this month and what this means for the future of interest rates and our housing markets. So whether you're an investor, a homeowner, or just a curious mind, our monthly deep dive with Pete promises to keep you informed and ahead of the curve. So, without further ado, let's get right into the conversation. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Well, I'm delighted to have Pete Morgan join us once again as one of Australia's most respected financial analysts and commentators. Pete brings his invaluable expertise to help us navigate this ever-changing landscape of our Australian property markets. Welcome, Pete. Thanks, Michael. I always enjoy coming on to do the Big Picture podcast, so looking forward to it as usual. Well, there's always lots to talk about in the Big Picture, and you've got, I guess, a global view of what's going on, because while you're spending most of your time in Australia, you're back in the UK again, I believe. Yeah, I spent the past uh, couple of months travelling around, actually a fair bit of regional Australia. I've been doing a roadshow across Victoria, uh, some of the regional cities in New South Wales and also Queensland. But yes, currently in Europe, so getting a bit of a global perspective on things. And it seems like the global economy is just feeling the pinch a little bit from all these interest rate hikes that we've had, and Australia won't be immune from that, of course. Well, there's lots happening in the global economy, including the challenges with the two significant wars going on around the world. But let's start with what's happening in Australia. And It happened again. The Reserve Bank hiked interest rates in November. That that ended a month reprieve for mortgage holders. But it seems to have renewed fears that inflation isn't falling as fast as the Reserve Bank would like, Pete. Not quite. Um, I think fuel prices were a fairly big part of that in the third quarter of this calendar year. So inflation came in at 1.2% for the September quarter. and Markets had expected 1.1%, so only fractionally higher. And over the year, yeah, 5.4% over the year. So that's down from the peak of 7.8%. And I guess by the next quarter, we'll be down to about four and a half. I guess the RBA had hoped that by the end of the year, we might be a bit closer to four. So, I mean, clearly inflation is on the way back down. And um, I think we'll find actually that those uh, higher fuel prices last quarter, well, the the oil prices actually dropped 20% as we speak here today. So in theory, anyway, we should start to see lower petrol prices ahead, and that will definitely help. There are still some challenges, I guess, with inflation, in particular, rising rents in the housing market. I guess the general trend is down. And uh, look, as we sit here today, financial markets aren't pricing for any further interest rate hikes in Australia. So this may be the peak, or we may get one more in December. We'll have to wait and see. We will have to wait and see. Now, interestingly, there isn't another quarterly interest CPI figure result coming for the Reserve Bank to make a decision on. I mean, this last decision happened on Melbourne Cup when, interestingly, uh, the winning horse was without a fight. And it seemed like the new governor of the Reserve Bank, Michelle Bullock, uh, went in uh, preparing to fight on. She, uh, I'm not sure, I can't imagine what's going on in her mind, but whether it was a political decision saying that, hey, look, I'm, I'm my own woman and I'm not going to make uh, be, be, be judged by what the government or what the media is saying. But they've only got one instrument, Pete. They've only got interest rates. But on the other hand, we've got huge migration and lots of people coming in to Australia with money, buying things, that's inflationary. And the various governments, the state governments and local governments, they're doing a lot of uh, building and infrastructure works. They're spending a lot of money. So the Reserve Bank's having quite a tough time. It is. Um, You made a good point, actually. We don't get any more quarterly inflation figures for quite some time. But actually, there is a monthly inflation gauge from the Melbourne Institute. October was actually negative. And that came off the back of a flat month in September and very little inflation in August. So if you actually look at the past three months, well, inflation, if you analyze that, it's pretty much zero. So maybe we'll find out 
that we were fighting yesterday's war. But I think when you think about it, new governor, inflation's still above target. I mean, the path of least regret is always going to be to hike. And I think there is, um, Australia has a, a, in a relative position of confidence, we've got a free floating Aussie dollar, unlike in, say, some of the European countries. Um, we've also got very responsive monetary policy. So if interest rates need to be cut next year quickly, um, there's very swift transmission mechanism in Australia, very different from, say, the US, where most people have 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Things are very slow to respond. So, yeah, it's interesting. If you look at what markets are pricing for next year, interest rates are expected to fall significantly in the UK, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Mexico, <laughs> pretty much everywhere, Eurozone as well. Um, so, look, Australia's we're a little bit behind the rest of the world, I guess, because we stayed locked down for a bit longer than some of those other countries and the borders were shut. But eventually we'll start coming down the other side as well. And this may or may not be the last hike we'll have to see. Well, I saw an interesting chart in social media that I reshared, which looked back over the last 50 years and the multiple rate hikes cycles we've had. And it showed that on average, rates dropped around 10 months after or started dropping around 10 months after the interest rate peak was reached. In other words, it rising interest rates do their job in due course, they slow down the economy, they create higher unemployment, they stop people's, people spending, people's budgets are being hurt. And so the economic cycle moves on and the Reserve Bank then has to lower interest rates to start stimulating the economy again. So you're right, it will happen and possibly sometime next year that interest rates are going to start falling. And they're going to get back to the neutral level and no one really knows exactly what they are, but probably around three, three and a quarter percent, I'd suggest, Pete. Yes, well, I guess there's a range of models to actually look at this and, you know, what's the real neutral rate and therefore, you know, if we've got an inflation target of two and a half percent on average, I guess, look, like, if you took an average of all the models out there, they would tell you that the neutral rate is about three and a half percent. But as you say, it's a pretty nebulous term, and it's one of the. It's a bit like um, you know, driving towards the horizon. You know, the closer to, you get to it, <laughs> these things can shift away from you. But yeah, let's say three and a half percent. And as you said, historically, when interest rates come down, they generally have come down quick and hard. It might be that we're um, higher for longer for a little period of time. But actually, if you look ahead, we may well see interest rates coming back down pretty quickly. And actually, if you look at the response of financial markets this week, well, uh, bond yields actually came down and uh, the Aussie dollar fell as well. So maybe markets are actually taking some comfort in the fact that um, the RBA is going to bash inflation back down to target come hell or high water. Yes. Well, the Reserve Bank governor also hinted that baby boomers is to blame for Australia's cost of living. We know that some people are affected more by rising interest rates than others, but we know that baby boomers in general own homes and many of them don't even have a mortgage against them. So therefore, rising interest rates are not going to affect them as much. And so she warned that inflation is going to stay higher for longer, blaming the older Australians. So she didn't say baby boomers specifically, even though I believe she's in that age group as well. It's not affecting everybody because people are still spending, aren't they? Retail spending was high again last month. I've seen it firsthand, actually. If you go out and about, you'll see that actually a lot of the pensioners or the baby boomers are still out eating out, spending. And I guess, as you said, most of them are either mortgage free and probably enjoying the uh, sort of higher interest income that they haven't had for a few years. Um, yeah, the retail figures were surprisingly strong last month. I think I was actually a part of this because I upgraded my iPhone to an iPhone 15. And uh, so apparently did a thousands of other Aussies around the country. Uh, also, it was a, an unusually, I'm not sure about Melbourne, but it was an unusually uh, warm period last month, which uh, contributed some uh, spending, you know, people out and about and uh, uh, spending when they might not otherwise have been. So we may well find that actually you know, if you if you track forward a few months, retail's coming back down. And actually, if you look at the volume of retail trade, well, it's been down for quite a long time. It's um, it, we tend to measure retail trade as a a dollar figure, but of course, prices are higher than they were a year ago. If you look at retail volumes, they're on the way down. And I think um, yes, we've got more people in the country, but generally, it's the mortgage belt that's really hurting. All these interest rates are just going to trim all that discretionary expenditure as, as they're designed to. They are. But it's the time of the year that they have those big sales. The Black Friday sales are going to be coming up 
and Christmas time, even though retail spending seems to have been brought forward a bit uh, from uh, December to November now with the Black Friday sales. I remember last year retail spending was up in the month of November. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this time around, Pete. It's a good point. I mean, we're supposed to seasonally adjust uh, all these figures, but when you get something that's a new trend, I mean, how long do you, uh, how many years of uh, higher retail turnover do you have to see before you actually adjust for the seasonality? Uh, but we used to have this issue with things like Chinese New Year. You know, we didn't uh, find it very easy to seasonally adjust the uh, Chinese arrivals figures because sometimes it, it spanned across January and February and others, other times it didn't. So, yeah, but I, look, I guess, you know, you'd look through the noise here and the general trend, I guess, will be lower. Pete, when we look at where money was spent, there was a lot of money spent on transport. That remained high. It was up 18.4% on last year. Baby movers in particular, but even the young people seem to be travelling a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And look, I guess when you've had a period where people haven't been able to travel, um, a lot of people have been taking the opportunity. There's also been more spending on fuel, uh, partly because uh, prices have been higher. And uh, also, um, yeah, just uh, various things. There's a bit of catch up, things like health services, which for uh, quite a period of time there, you know, people weren't going to spend on those things. They didn't want to get out and about so much, but that's coming back. So yeah, like spending in the economy, you know, it's held up maybe better than you might have expected. But don't forget, you always have a lag with monetary policy. Um, you hike an interest rate uh, you know, today. It might be 18 months before you see the full impact of that. And of course, uh, we've seen interest rates go up quicker or well, the fastest uh, hiking cycle in a generation, really. So, yeah, there's going to be um, still uh, the big couple of the big banks reported this week. And there's still fixed rate mortgages to reset over the next six months. So, you know, each time that happens, that's another person with a higher mortgage to pay or higher repayment. And um, that tends to just slow down the spending. So it's starting to happen. Well, when we turn to the property markets, all the research houses showed again that at the end of October, so now into the month of November, property prices keep rising. In other words, close to 10 months of rising property prices. Core logic is suggesting that the total value of all the residential real estate in Australia is up to ten point one trillion. Remember last year when it got to ten trillion, uh, that was a real milestone. Then property values overall dropped, depending upon where you were. But in February, uh, January, February this year, the market turned around and it's now reaching new highs every month. Not something that would have been expected, I think. If you if you went back to when interest rates were stuck at zero, if you'd have said that we get 10 months of rising prices, even with all these rate hikes, I don't think um, anyone would have predicted it. You certainly know models would have predicted it because borrowing capacities have come right down. But it's quite clear what's driven that. It's record high immigration. Um, lots of builders and developers are just pulling up stumps, a lot of them going insolvent. Loads of projects are being scrapped. So there's just a massive dwelling shortage building up in the capital cities. And I think, you know, it's just, you know, it's a cliche, but supply and demand, as they say, rental vacancy is the lowest on record. You know, people, there's a, there's a genuine sort of general fear of missing out. We've got expats trying to get a foothold on the ladder. Chinese money's coming back. So there's, there's a lot of factors really that are pushing demand higher, particularly the immigration. And uh, at a time when we've got a real shortage brewing of dwelling stock. Well, it's created a rise in the value of homes, but also apartments. Apartments overall are performing pretty nicely, not as strongly as houses, but I guess people are changing how they want to or how they can afford to live related to uh, affordability issues, Pete. Yeah, I think that's the borrowing capacity is coming down. That's a part of it. Look, in um, some parts of the country like Brisbane, there was really a decade there where apartment prices didn't do a lot. Then suddenly they're really taking off. I expect you might see a bit of that in Melbourne too, you know, in some of those areas which don't get so overbuilt. There's a lot of pressure on land values. Yeah, there's been a there was a period of underperformance there. But it's yeah, usually with the apartment market, there's there's different segments. You know, there's the high-rise towers, which really went out of favor during COVID for obvious reasons. But then some of the more boutique blocks that feel a bit more like a home, well, they're, they're doing very well in some parts of Sydney, certainly in Brisbane. It's, it's a bit granular, but overall prices are up. Well, CBRE, the large international real estate firm, suggested that rent rises are going to continue at least 
for another three years. And that's, again, based on supply and demand. They're suggesting vacancy rates are going to fall even further to 0.8% by 2028, down from around the 1% now they've got. And these tight conditions are just going to ensure that rents are going to keep going up because, as we keep saying, developers are just not building. But at the moment, the sort of immigrants that are coming to Australia, the people coming, a lot of them are students, a lot are on temporary visas, aren't they? And they tend to rent rather than buy. Well, you you may find that vacancy rates don't fall a whole lot further because I think what we saw during COVID was... They can't, Pete, can they? (laughs) We're almost at zero vacancy. Yeah, there's always going to be some frictional vacancies. That's the way it is. And also, we did see during COVID, there was a fall in the average household size as people moved outwards, they wanted more space. Well, We'll probably see you know, there's so much pressure on the rental market um, that that will, will start to reverse. I think we've seen a huge increase in demand for um, house sharing, uh, certainly seeing that on the Sunshine Coast and uh, websites like Flatmates have seen a nearly a 40% increase in demand over the year. Uh, we'll probably see more people staying with parents for longer. So there's lots of ways that the market will adjust. But yeah, overall, yeah, we've got record high temporary visas. I mean, surprisingly, strong numbers even now, the September quarter, was another 176,000 temporary visas in the quarter. That's a lot of people over three months. And over the year, it's about half a million higher. So, and as you said, most people who come in to the country are not here to buy property on day one. They're, they're generally renters. So that's putting a lot of pressure on the rental markets, Yeah, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, but actually Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, have all got vacancy rates under 1%. So very, very tight. So it's a combination of supply and demand. So while the media talks about ugly, greedy landlords putting up rents, taking advantage of tenants to make up for their higher mortgage costs or insurance costs or the land tax, it really is supply and demand because a couple of years ago when it was the other way around, as you said, there were oversupplies in lots of areas, rents didn't move up much. But the same CBRE forecast suggested Sydney moving forward uh, between 2024 and 2028, there's going to be only... Only 14,000 new apartment dwellings delivered a year compared to the average over the last decade of much higher than that. And their predicted demand of 33,000 apartments required each year. In Melbourne, the new supply is going to be even less. We're, and it's easy to tell with apartments because there's the long period of construction they first got to get development approvals then they've got to in many cases pre-sell sure some build to rent won't be pre-selling but they've got an idea of how many are being built and in melbourne they're suggesting the there's going to be an average delivery of ten thousand new apartments a year between 2024 next year and 2028 that's nearly 40 percent below sydney's level but the demand for housing stock houses and, and, and apartments is going to be something like 38,000 over the, per year over the next five years. And Brisbane, much the same. They're only going to be delivering 6,500 apartments a year when the demand for housing stock is likely to be three times that. So no end in sight for the rental or, in fact, the housing crisis, Pete. As you said, uh, this is really a case of using your eyes as much as anything. I mean, officially, Building approvals, we're approving about 13,000 a month or thereabouts, so 167,000 over the past year. So that's the lowest in over a decade. And don't forget, a lot of these building approvals actually replace existing dwellings. So uh, you can can knock another 10% off that. But actually, forget all the official stats. I mean, officially, there's something like 240,000 dwellings I I use the phrase advisedly, under construction. But in reality, so many projects have been delayed. They've been mothballed or scrapped. Loads of developers are going insolvent. There was nearly 800 last quarter. And that's not going to get better with another rate hike. So in reality, so many apartment projects just aren't happening. And, um, you know, this is complete contrast. If you think back to 2015 and 2016, you could see the apartment oversupply was everywhere. Parramatta, Blacktown. Mascot, Green Square, the Shire, d- down your way around Docklands and South Bank, the CBD. And it, Brisbane is probably the biggest oversupply of the lot around um, the Valley and South Bank and West End and Tawong and Newstead. Well, this time it's, it, there's just nothing by comparison. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is going to be an ongoing issue because it's just not feasible for developers to take on the risk of a new apartment project. There would actually be loss-making projects anyway. 
So apartment prices have to rise before we're going to see a supply response. Um, the only projects we're seeing get up generally are just at the more premium end of the market. So if you've got a, you know, a flash apartment project in Rose Bay, well, maybe those will get a, get across the line. But it's the affordable apartments that just aren't going to get built. And that's the real problem. That's going to drive rents and prices higher for just for generic apartments across the capital cities. Well, you're right in the fact that the more affluent population that right sizes or downsizes, they're able to and prepared to pay for apartments. But that's not really going to fix the supply demand ratio for the very large number of students coming in. But in my suburb where I live in Brighton, where our Melbourne offices are, there's quite a lot of apartment complexes built for people wanting to move out of homes. They're large, they're big, they're multi million dollar apartments, but they're being purchased. And in many cases, with people without any mortgages because they've got cash left over when they sell their home. Having said that, as we mentioned a few times, there's not enough of the apartments for most people uh, and all the new people coming in. It's hard to put some context to how many people are coming in. If you look at the population of Hobart, it's suggested it's around 250, 260,000 people at the moment. So we're bringing in two or three Hobarts a year into Australia each at the moment? Well, I've been saying for a while, eventually these um, total population growth figures have to come down because a big part of the rebound has been temporary visas, in particular international students. But um, yeah, I mean, it's been what over 600,000 population growth, we think, this year or uh, over the past year. And yeah, eventually it will slow down. But even then, you know, if it's slowing to 450 or 400, well, we're not building for that kind of population growth. And, you know, this is becoming a bit of a political um, issue. You know, it's not popular. The government is on its first term and it's probably got some goodwill. But, yeah, people are seeing capital city uh, rents rising at a double-digit pace. And they can see infrastructure struggling to keep up with a record population growth. So there'll be some pressure on the government to make some changes here. Yeah, so there's a lot happening. And it's been a very unusual few years in that regard. So we, we had a couple of years where population growth from immigration anyway, basically stops. Uh, but now we've completely caught up. It's like COVID never happened. Well, it's a combination of the fact that people are coming in and not many students are leaving at the moment, Pete, finishing their studies because we haven't had them over the last couple of years. Yeah, that's a big factor as well. And there's a, always a seasonal element to this. But um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly the latest figures suggest there's been no slowdown at all so far in immigration. So uh, yeah, lots of pressure, and it's um, yeah. You can just see people are starting to get very frustrated with it. But at the moment, anyway, the unemployment rate, uh, the last reading was only three point six percent. So um, the the population growth is being absorbed by the strong la- labour market. I guess that will start to change next year, though. It will. So. When we look at Australia's population, recently a survey released from the Australian Bureau of Statistics showed the nature of our population and that 29.5% of Australians were overseas born, you, including me. Uh, so we're a very multicultural society. <laughs> yeah, so it's about 30% of Aussies born overseas. But actually, if you include Aussies with a foreign-born parent, it suddenly leaps to about half. So you're right, it's a very... A uh, mixed bag of multicultural population these days. Uh, Simon Kustenmacher um, shared some really good infographics on this, as he always does. And uh, yeah, it was interesting to see uh, the number of people born in England in particular and, and the United Kingdom has actually been falling for quite some time. And it's, uh, the growth is all coming from India, China, and to some extent, New Zealand as well. Uh, so if you project this out over the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's going to be a much more Asian-based population than it is now. Far less Anglo, not so many European migrants, but lots. In particular, India is now uh, taking pole position. Um, so that, that's a big change from what we saw a decade or two ago. Uh, China was the, the main source of migration for a long time, but India is really ramping up as well now. Well, if we look forward, I just recently had a chat with Lailani Bara, uh, the CEO of ID, uh, the demographer's called Informed Decisions, and her team dropped a bombshell of a report suggesting uh, what's going to happen to Australia over the next 25 years. ID demographers were suggesting that it's going to be 7.4 million Australians, 2 million new homes required, and interestingly, a seismic shift back to urban living, that uh, while there is going to be growth in regional Australia, the vast majority 
of Australians are going to new Australians and are going to be living in our three big capital cities. In fact, the four largest states are going to receive 93% of Australia's forecast population growth over the next 20 years. But the majority of those are actually going to go to the capital cities, not just anywhere in the states, Pete. There's been a bit of a tug of war going on, hasn't there, over the past year? I noticed just in the past week or two, a couple of big banks and financial services firms have said that bonuses are going to be tied to office attendance. So there's some of the big firms are really trying to insist on people going back to the office at least two or three days a week and not just being fully based at home. I think actually some of the the affordability advantage of moving regionally has been eroded over the past couple of years. Um, so it's not quite as attractive as it might have been back during the COVID period when you could effectively move somewhere for half the price. Well, that's no longer the case. If you come to a place like uh, Noosa or the Sunshine Coast, it's not really any cheaper to go regionally. So yeah, there's a few things that are pulling people back. I mean, most new migrants tend to go to the big cities anyway. And then internally, people move up to southeast Queensland largely. There's going to be a lot of debate about how we could get more medium density dwellings built. Uh, there'll be a lot of debate about zoning changes, um, encouraging construction. But for the next two or three years, though, we're going to be facing a big shortage of dwellings. It's just not cost effective at the moment to deliver the stock. Well, I think that's the bottom line of our chat today, Pete, that despite rising interest rates and difficulty with affordability, the lack of supply at a time of increasing demand is going to outweigh all those other factors and that's just going to underpin rental growth and property price growth over the next year it's unlikely it's going to be as strong as it was this year i mean many of the capital cities are going to end up with double digit growth this year but next year all the banks have now come out with their forecast they're suggesting somewhere between five and seven percent capital growth in our capital cities next year I'm not sure how much to believe them because it was this time last year, only this time last year, that they all said the prices were going to drop 10, 15, and some even 20%. But having said that, the fundamentals look sound for our housing markets. It would make sense for uh, price growth to be slower in 2024, simply because mortgage rates have been higher and borrowing capacities have come down. But um, as you said, there's still a lot of um, pressure and we're certainly getting a lot of inquiries around Brisbane for people just wanting to buy. I think because the rental market is just an absolute quagmire at the moment. And um, yeah, it's just a general fear of missing out, I think. It's, um, people can see population growth running at sort of 2 to 3% and the growth in construction is just no way keeping pace. Um, so yeah, I'd say ongoing price growth is the most likely scenario, but maybe not quite as quick as we've seen this year. Well, we'll be back once a month talking about the big picture the macroeconomic factors for, that affect our economy and our property markets. Now, if people want to keep up to date with all your thoughts between now and then, or in the future, of course, also, how do they get in contact with you? Where do they follow you, Pete? Uh, Pete Wardgen Daily Blog um, is Pete Wardgen Blogspot, so you can see me there once a day. And also, I'm pretty active on social media, on Twitter as well, so I'm pretty easy to find. Well, I'll leave a link to both of those, and I... Uh, follow your daily blog. I get that every morning. And I uh, also uh, enjoy your podcasts, uh, especially the Sunday morning one with Chris Bates, where you talk about the news as well. Uh, so I'll leave a link where we can get in contact with you and look forward to catching up with you again in a month. Fabulous. Thanks, Michael. I always enjoy my monthly big picture chats with Pete Wargent. And if you got some benefit from it and you don't yet subscribe to this podcast, before we get on to the next couple of segments of our show, please just stop for a sec, go to whatever podcast app you're listening to this on and follow this show so that twice a week you get the information from me and my guests. Now, you would have heard from Pete and my discussion a moment ago that, yeah, there are some headwinds ahead. And our property markets are going to face challenges in 2024, but they're still, I think in 12 months' time, when we sit back and have a look at the end of 2024, the markets are going to be, well, many selected markets are going to be considerably stronger. Prices are going to be higher. Rents are going to be higher. And some people are going to take advantage of that. I know between now and then, some are going to drop out of the market. They are. Investors are dropping out. They haven't got their finance right, or it just all seems a bit too hard at the moment. 
But the majority of people who are interested in property investment or buying a home are just going to sit there and wait. I don't know. I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but for things to be clearer. And by the time everything is clearer, the market will have moved to the next level again. So if you're unsure what to do in our changing property markets, I don't know, maybe the banks have throttled your property plans. Maybe the media's got you uncertain. Maybe you're not sure whether it's time to buy it or you should sell first or what's going on. Why not have a chat with my team at Metropole to help give you some directions and certainty? Go to metropole.com.au and have a complimentary wealth discovery session. By the way, we're more than just buyer's agents. We're strategists to help our clients safely create intergenerational wealth by giving property and wealth advice. And we do it safely because we're using frameworks that I've fine-tuned over five decades and we've been helping clients with for over 20 years. So we offer time-tested frameworks. We've got a proven track record. We've got on-the-ground experience and we don't have any properties to sell. So it doesn't matter where you're looking to buy or whether it's commercial or residential, if it's a home or an investment, why not have a chat with our team? We can, well, I guess we're big enough to tip the needle in your favour, but still small enough to care. Metropole.com.au. And as I said, we're more than what? just buyers agents, what Metropole Wealth Advisory with Ken Race and Kate Forbes assists high net worth investors, professional and business people. We've got property renovations and development, property management, and Mark Creedon's mastermind for business. Metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to talk with you about the seeds of success. Now, you've probably heard the old Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. Now, in my book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, my co-author, Tom Corley, talks about his rich habits study, where he studied the habits of the wealthy people and compared them to the average person. And he found that almost every one of the self-made millionaires in his rich habits study pursued their dreams, despite the fact that they weren't ready. It didn't matter that they didn't know what they were doing. It didn't matter that they didn't have enough money. It didn't matter that no one on the ground believed in them. So a self-made millionaire is just hardwired to be courageous. Are they just hardwired to have greater confidence? Are they hardwired with greater intelligence? Well, Tom Corley says, no, no, they're not. They simply have a stronger passion for some dream, and that passion produces a very powerful type of energy that Tom calls emotional energy. Emotional energy enables dreamers to take action every day on their dream. Taking action enables them to learn, to figure out what to do, to figure out what not to do. And that learning helps them grow in their knowledge and grows their confidence, which further stimulates them to continue to take action on their dream. Tom Corley believes that within the DNA of every human being are seeds of success. Unfortunately for most individuals, these seeds of success remain dormant their entire lives. But what brings about these seeds of success to life is the pursuit of a dream and goals, the goals behind that dream. The pursuit of the dream is the key to unleashing your inner success traits. So when you pursue a dream, you germinate those seeds of success that exist with inside you. What are the seeds of success? Well, Tom Corley says their courage, their confidence, their intelligence, their persistence, their single-minded focus, enthusiasm, motivation, mental agility, mental endurance, resilience, attention to detail, and hard work ethic. Interesting, isn't it? So, passion in pursuit of a dream is the water, the sunshine, and the soil that brings to life and nourishes these seeds of success in you. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private 
Facebook group. Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?